Hey, it's December 21st. And for us Rush fans, that means it's 2112 day. That's right. 1221 is 2112 day. So here at the Loud Boy channel, we are celebrating in the best way possible. Out of the archives from my network attached server, I have found an hour's worth of footage from our 40. That's right, the final tour of our favorite band Rush. And that'll be up. You guys can check it out. It's really sweet stuff. That was an amazing concert. So I'm looking forward to sharing that with you guys, and I really hope you enjoy it. But also, I have a little documentary that I've been producing. This is my commentary and my reaction to the return of my Portnoy to Dream Theater. That's right. Portnoy is back. Dream Theater, the family's back together again. And I have a bunch of thoughts on it. So really, I hope you enjoy this as a Rush fan and a Dream Theater fan. It's all about Portnoy. It's about Dream Theater. Talk about Neil Peart, of course, and Rush. So please, check this out. I hope you enjoy it. Leave your comments. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe if you want to see more videos like this in the future. I thank you guys so much. I have a lot of new subscribers recently. And to each and every one of you, thank you. Um, there's going to be a lot more content like this that is not particularly gaming focused. I, I have a lot of varied interests and things that I'm into. And I'd like to talk about those. And I'd like to make videos about those. So I'm hoping that you'll enjoy what I share. And stick around. Check them out. So as one Rush fan to another, thank you for coming by. Thank you for hanging out with me. I appreciate you guys more than you know. Mike Portnoy is back. Back with the boys after many years. And the other Mike is gone. We're going to be discussing both today. Plus... Dream Theater, a little bit of Rush, music, story, life, all of this when we consider the implications, the importance, and the newsworthiness of the return of Mike Portnoy to Dream Theater. Thanks guys for coming today. This is Loud Boy. Life is fascinating. Our lives are fascinating. Have you ever considered all of the different times in which we live? Not the times when we talk about the world in general and what's going on, but the different moments of our lives, the different times of our lives, and more importantly, the experiences each one of us has. Life has many ups and downs. Life can be chaotic, crazy, stressful, intimidating, inducing fear. Life can also be about love and those around you and what you love, who you love, and the feelings that invokes inside each one of us. Life can also be peaceful, a moment to catch your breath, to appreciate the beauty of creation the beauty of this world, the beauty inside of others, where we truly appreciate and we just, we marvel at what's around us. All of these things, including exhilaration, when your first child is born, your second, your third, your fourth, the day you get married, the day you find out you have a new job, the day a new opportunity and the hope for that opportunity comes true. And you're just filled with excitement and, and, you, and you're just ecstatic at what that moment brought you. There's, life can also be sad, mournful, where you get down. Some people get depressed and anxious. That's where you need prayer. All of these different times, it's just part of life, isn't it? And that's the way it's supposed to be. Yes, life is supposed to be that way. And the best stories reflect this. The stories, movies, television, books, all reflect the human condition. What is a human condition? Well, one way to say it is the different times of your life. 
the different moments we each go through as we experience the ebb and flow of life. This is what makes it interesting. All of this, again, reflected in the best books you can think of, movies and television, the stories we tell each other, all reflect this in their own way as they're telling a story of whatever protagonist. Um, that protagonist faces adversity as he's going towards his goal to defeat an enemy, the antagonist, and then in the best stories, he's victorious. Or she is victorious. The beauty of all of this is that music does the same thing. Music can do the same thing. Music doesn't always. And I give reference point most of today's modern music. Uh, and yet the best music does what the best stories and films and television do. The best music can reflect these things of which I've spoken about our lives, the ebb and flow. One of the best bands I can think of that does this is Dream Theater. Their music has a tension and release. Their music has extremely fast, aggressive, sometimes metal, and yet it's always rock. And some would describe it as progressive rock. I love Dream Theater's music. And just as important, I love the lyrics. I'm a huge, huge Rush fan. Way back when I was in either 8th or ninth grade, could have been 7th, I was still listening to pop music. I would still listen to Casey Kasem on the radio in the top 40. It's all I knew. I was exposed to some, quote, classic rock from my dad. And, I, and back in the day, believe it or not, I listened to 8-tracks. Look it up if you don't know what an 8-track is. And then, of course, I listened to vinyl. Of course, these days we know what vinyl is. It's made a beautiful comeback. And I'll be talking more about vinyl in a moment. So I would listen to that. And, and it was all about top 40 and pop music. And that's all I knew. And then uh, a young man who was in high school moved up from Texas. I lived in Vermont at the time. He moved from Texas to Vermont. He moves from Texas to Vermont. And basically, he, uh, he, I woke up one morning, and Welcome to the Jungle was playing. That changed things. That song changed things. And I'm like, okay, what is this? Soon thereafter, though, he's driving me around. And in his little Nissan pickup truck, uh, we're going back and forth to like band practice. In those days, I played what I play. I still play drums. Before I switched to saxophone, he played drums. Amazing drummer. He was an amazing drummer. Probably still is. So, in his truck, though, were about 10 to 12, probably 12, uh, cassettes. Every one of them were Rush. And I'd open up this cassette case, and I'd look, Rush. It wasn't soon thereafter I got introduced to Rush. Blew my mind. And then, through one of those... Columbia House things, I get my first Rush cassette tape. That was 2112. Of course, I have it right back here. This is on vinyl. I own probably three copies, multiple CDs, the DVD music. I mean, I, I own like every possible version of 2112. This album changed everything. When the, the mini mood comes in and the whole space sounds and then the first hits... Uh, when Rush starts playing, my mind was blown. Completely and utterly blown. Changed forever. I never went back. I never went back to the music that I listened to before. Rush changed everything. To this day, Rush remains my favorite band. They will never be eclipsed. They are the top. I mourned in my own way for three, six months when Neil passed. That very night I wept. I screamed at my kid. I apologized later. I felt awful. I was, talk about the lows, right? Losing Neil, 
It still hurts. Neil, if you were to describe him, if I were to describe Neil Peart, he was like a second father to me. The things that that man taught me, through his lyrics, through his dedication and mastery of the drums, to his books, to his blog, uh, all of his writings, and I've read almost all of them, to the way he spoke on camera and how he spoke, to most of his beliefs, his view of the world, his mastery of the English language, um, his intellect, his constantly challenging himself, his wanting to master new things just because he could. Um, you know, he told this story once, Neil did, when he was young, he saw was a crocheting or knitting, one of the two. He had to learn it, and he learned it. That kind of mind, of course, reflects the mind of my own dad. My own dad is a renaissance man. He is a master of many things in the artistic fields and more. And Neil, in a way, mirrored that. Um, Neil Peart changed me, still does, made me a better man, was like a second father to me. Losing Neil was hard. Still is. I can't listen to Rush much anymore because I get emotional often because of the loss, because of the beauty of the things that I hear from their music, from his lyrics. You know, I can't watch my Blu-rays as much of, of them in concert. Um, I feel blessed, though, to have known him. He's on the wall right behind my camera, by the way. It's just a picture of them on Rolling Stone. Uh, you probably know the one come out in like 2012, I think. It's a picture of the three of them. Um, Rush changed me. And, and my speaking of Neil takes nothing away from how I feel about Getty and Alex. And I can't imagine the loss, you guys. I can't imagine... I'm sure you feel sad every day, Alex. And, and and Olivia? To lose your dad? I'm sorry. I hope you're okay, Olivia. I really do. And, and you too, Carrie. So, I started speaking of Rush and Neil because they will never be replaced as my favorite number one band. But number two... Number two is Dream Theater. Uh, was it? Uh, 1992. Images and Words comes out. Late at night, I'm watching Headbangers Ball. I don't know if I was doing homework or just hanging out in my room. MTV is on Headbangers Ball. What, the host there said he held up the CD. I should have grabbed it. Where is it? Oh, it's out in the living room. He held up his Images and Words CD. And uh, he said, for you Rush fans, you've got to listen to this band. Okay. I had to check it out, right? A, on MTV, they mentioned the word Rush. That's like a curse word to MTV. And so when he mentioned Rush fans, you've got to listen to Dream Theater. I, this is something. So I go out, I get the Images and Words CD. Blew my mind. Images and Words blew my mind. And there were many moments in my musical life all of the things that I've enjoyed and things that changed me through the years. Hearing Living Color for the first time, Cult of Personality, Living Color is like number four of my favorite bands. If I were to create a list, I love Living Color. Hearing images and words, because in that moment, in that moment, I knew that I could like something almost as much as Rush. I knew that there was a band that was... <sighs> It could affect me as much as Rush. I could enjoy the complexity and the beauty and the pure mastery of, of instruments. Um, it was like Rush Jr. And I, I like to call, uh, you know, Dream Theater, myself, my best friend. Those of us who love Rush and love Dream Theater, I call Dream Theater the sons of Rush. You know, back in Berkeley School of Music, um, John... 
and John and Mike, uh, who eventually formed Dream Theater, they were all students there. They would play Rush songs as, to practice and tune up. Even Dream Theater played Rush in their earliest days because it's that common language. They all spoke that type of music because they love that. Of course, they love a lot of different things, influenced by many different bands, types of music. That's evident in Dream Theater's music. However, the love of Rush is something that I also share and therefore creates a common bond. And that common bond is something that I could relate to on a personal level. And so Dream Theater did that. Dream Theater does that. So there's that common bond, and, and that's really important. I have never seen Mike Portnoy play live. The, only, the, uh, the three times that I've been blessed to see Dream Theater were in just the past few years. Uh, I believe in, I brought both my sons. I mean, for my, I believe the first time I saw Dream Theater was the Images and Words 25, 25th anniversary, Images and Words Beyond. And that uh, my best friend and I, we were down in Texas. And we saw them there. And, oh, we got to meet them. We got to meet Dream Theater. Uh, my friend paid for the, uh, the meet and greet. We waited in line. And then we got closer and I could see the boys. And I started getting excited. I'm like, there's John. Hey. <laughs> I'm like, uh, there's the wizard. I mean, I was, I was like nudging him. I was just like, oh, these are the boys. You know, and I, I will never probably be blessed enough to meet, of course, not Neil. But you ever get to meet Getty and Alex? Uh, if I did, it would be mind-blowing. I, I don't know what I would do. I mean... <sighs> Few things in life would reduce me to being some kind of, sh you know, sh shivering fanboy. Meeting Getty and Alex would do that, but also meeting Dream Theater, I, I, it was crazy. So we get up to the table, and in the back of my mind, I'm like, you know, ask him or say something witty and ask him a question. So I did. I can't remember everything I did. Here's what's great. Oh, and they, they signed stuff for us. And... We're only allowed two items, okay? We're only allowed to get two items signed. Me being me, I, I thought I could get away with three. I'm not trying to break the rules. It's more about the excitement of the moment. This, though, is signed by John. Is that coming out? Okay. Uh, it's not signed by John, and it's signed by uh, the wizard. No, 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 Mike. Mike Mangini. And, and, and John Petrucci. Yes, this is an original Moving Pictures album, vinyl. Okay, this is not a reprint. This sucker is original. And it is signed by... And when I walked up, I told John, I said, uh, I said... <sighs> what did I say? I basically told John, I conveyed the fact that I knew he loved them too, this being one of my, my favorite band, one of my favorite albums, and considered a masterpiece by Rush, and it would mean everything to have you guys sign it. So, uh, I believe John signed it first, and then Mike, and then one of the bosses there you know someone who works for dream theater came up and said you can only have two items so i had to put this sucker away all right and that get out my official two items all right so but it means so much that i had my favorite band's album signed by dream theater this is huge and then of course being the album that introduced me to dream theater the album for which, in Images and Words, the tour, 25th anniversary, I had to get that signed. So this is my vinyl signed by all of Dream Theater. Okay? All the boys' names are there. And then I thought the eponymous, cool-looking album cover with their logo, this is signed by Dream Theater. Of course, Mike Mangini, who's not with us anymore. Well, man, I'm sorry.
I'm sorry, Mike. You took it like a champ. And when other Mike came, other Mike, when Portnoy came back, I'm sure you're like, okay, uh, I'm sorry, Mike. I really am, dude. But yeah, this is signed by all the boys. All right, so there you go. Sign stuff. We got to meet them. We got to shake their their hands. We also got to stand for a photo with them, me and my best friend, and and that was very cool. I took a lot of great pictures of the actual concert. Uh, it was an amazing concert. Um, it it oh, so good. All right. The next time though we saw them was a Dream Theater was playing the entirety of the Metropolis Part 2 album. Oh, that was amazing. All right, so I've mentioned certain points in, in my musical history that made... So for Dream Theater, though, Rush, it was 2112. And what am I talking about? 2112, as Neil called it, was the the gate key, or he described it as that, that momentous shift in the band becoming the band, and the band becoming getting their independence, their freedom, uh, solidifying their career. That was twenty one twelve. The stories are very similar because before that, the record labels were all over Rush. They didn't believe in them. They wanted albums quickly. They wanted shorter songs, and uh, their manager said yes, yes, yes. He just nodded away, and then they come up with twenty one twelve, a twenty plus minute masterpiece. Dream Theater, though. Same thing. When Dream Theater recorded Falling Into Infinity, I know the label was all over them. One of their songs talks about it. Talks about the vacuous, brain-dead nature of MTV. You know, that was they were angry at where they were, and and they were all I just know they were all over them. They wanted shorter songs. Dream Theater tried to give them that and did give them that with Falling Into Infinity. Not my favorite album. I doubt it's Dream Theater's favorite album. Following that was Metropolis Part 2, Scenes from a Memory. In my opinion, that is Dream Theater's 2112. Because they just said, forget it. We are going to be ourselves. We are going to write how we want, what we want, the way we want. And... Hold on. I had my playlist up here with all my albums. There we go. Uh, apologies. So, but Metropolis Part 2 was that. And like 2112, except they went further, didn't they? With regard to the length of music. This is an entire, entire CD. I believe like 80 minutes telling one story. Yes, there are separate songs, but they're really one giant opus, epic piece of music. Uh, scenes from a memory, oh, masterpiece, masterpiece. Um, dream any good piece of music. I mean, think classical, think opera, think uh, a really good player musical. There's always an opening piece. Uh, the introductory introduction suite, and that introduces all the thematic material musically that you'll be then hearing for the rest. Any good story does that. It sets up, and then it pays off, and, and, and both Dream Theater and Rush can do this. Dream Theater does this masterfully, where in this opening piece of music, you'll hear all the different themes of the different songs and melodies uh, that you'll hear later in the album, and they're paid off later on when you actually hear them in their entirety. But Scenes From My Memory did that. So seeing that live was amazing. I saw it twice. Once with my eldest son and my best friend in Texas. The next time I, they came back around, I brought my other son. And uh, because they were in Memphis, I believe. Uh, yeah, we went to Graceland. Uh, Dream Theater played Graceland. Both of those times we were on the floor, first or second row. John could have spit on us if he wanted to. Uh, we were on the floor so close, watching John just shred. Oh, John. Brother, you are amazing. But all three of those times were with Mike Mangini. And by the way, when Mike Mangini came on, what album was it? 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A dramatic turn of events. All right, so Mike Portnoy leaves, and I've seen the inner, the uh, the audition videos. In, in perfect karma, wrong word, perfect uh, serendipitous uh, coincidence. Uh, he was a teacher at Berkeley School of Music, I believe, um, uh, Mike Mangini, and basically he uh, he joined Stream Theater. I believe they had already tracked everything by then with like click tracks and, and you know whatever drum machines, yada yada. But and then he came in and did his parts afterwards. So I don't believe he contributed as much as he did in the future on a dramatic turn of events. There are some beautiful songs on that album. Uh, Breaking All Illusions might very well be my favorite Dream Theater song of all time. Might be because to me though, it is them, that song, the music and the lyrics. Uh, nice job, John, by the way, my own bass for writing those lyrics, I believe. That song is them at their progressive height. I mean, one of them, but I just love that song. I love the themes at the end when it says, don't waste the day, don't turn away. Life's true intent needs patience. Beautiful words. Life's true intent needs patience, which is kind of what we're talking about today, isn't it? When the ebbs and flows of life and what's important and how music reflects that. Yeah, Mike Portnoy coming back, man. I know, right? You came here to to hear me talk about that, and I've talked about everything else. You know, there's a lot to say, and there's not a lot to say. What does that mean? Yeah, Portnoy founded the band with John, and John um, Portnoy is hands down, other than Peart, could be, you know, definitely one of the best drummers of all time. And if I were to list them in my brain real quick, Portnoy would be number two. Yeah. Mike Mangini, three. I don't know why I did that order. Or maybe they both share two. <laughs> and Neil will never be eclipsed. Getty will never be eclipsed. Alex Rush. He can't be. But Dream Theater, number two. And that's a great place to be. You know, when, when there's the pinnacle and the summit, and you're not allowed to go above that because... It just is, then number two is really number one. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not describing this well. I don't want to use too many analogies. Portnoy coming back surprised me, and yet I wasn't. I knew that they, you guys, had uh, been working together on what Liquid Attention, and he think he did a couple songs with you on your latest album, John. Um, uh, so. Yeah, John Petrucci's latest album, I believe uh, Portnoy played a couple tracks. During the whole stupid lockdown era, uh, you guys were making videos together. So it, it was clear that things were afoot. Things were happening. And I'm sure it was only a matter of time where you guys are sitting around one day, maybe one night, uh, sharing, you know, whatever. And, and, and you're probably sitting around and, and one of you probably said, hey, you know what? You know what might be cool? I guess how I imagine it in my head. Two old bonded friends chatting, re remembering the old times, thinking ahead. I mean, and that's what this is. This is really the gathering of the family again. And it's great. It's great to have the family back together again. And that's how I'd, I would describe it. Someone coming home back to the family. And that was really graceful for a Mancini. You know, I'm sure it hurts. Dream job with Dream Theater. Uh, I'm sure that hurts. But maybe we could say that some things are inevitable. And, you know, maybe if you guys never, quote, patched it up, I'm sure there could have been some bad blood. I hope there wasn't. These are all my imaginings. So forgive me. Um... Whatever it was to truly rekindle and then want to post videos, you know, that's kind of just our proof that things are going on. Then, yes, you guys getting back together was inevitable. Because in the best stories, A, you know, the good guy always wins. And I'm not saying one's good, one's bad. What I'm saying is the good guy also has a family. Family is important. Family should be and is the root and center of all good stories. Um, 
And therefore, when a family gets back together, the good guy wins, if you will. And the original family is arguably, of course, the original guys that formed the band. Yeah, you've had, what, two or three keyboard players. And yet, ever since uh, the wizard joined you guys, Metropolis Part 2, he has been part of the family. It's like he's been there all along. Jordan, you're amazing. Okay? Well, amazing doesn't even cover it. Uh, the music musicianship level of Dream Theater, of every member of the band, is undeniable. You know, it's like, hey... I want to form a band. Okay, give me five, the best five players in the world. Okay, we, yeah, let's, let's, we got Dream Theater. I mean, that's what Dream Theater is with either mic. But Jordan is central to that. You know, Jordan's ability to keep up with and challenge Petrucci. There's only, there's few people on this planet that could do that. And the fact that, you know, John can shred on his guitar and Jordan can emulate that with perfection by ear is undeniably astounding. So, and I guess few drummers can sit in with and keep up with the music. Mangini, I can, you know, to learn the volume of music that preceded you, mastering it, then recording new tracks, few people in the world and throughout history could do that. I mean, Jeannie, you should get a gold medal. Okay, if we were giving away gold medals for, hey, new guy, come join this insane band and try to keep up. But no, don't keep up. Be part of them, one cohesive unit, and still be Dream Theater. Oh, you should get four gold medals. I mean, Jeannie, you are amazing. It was an honor, honor to get to see you live. Honor, it was an honor to meet you, to get you to sign my albums. Just truly an honor. And Mangini, on behalf of me and everyone in the audience, I want to say thank you. Thank you for keeping my band alive. Thank you. You're awesome. Thank you, buddy. And with that, yes, Portnoy. I'm still a little bit hurt that he left. We all were. It's like, hey, we got a family. Oh, dad's leaving. What? He's my dad. He can't leave. It's my dad. Dads shouldn't leave. Dads do. And boy, do I have words for them. I'll refrain. I think you get the gist. But I mean, if I were to make an analogy, yeah, it'd be like a parent leaving. It's like, what? I, no. Really? I won't go into... Maybe I should. Maybe I should just let it all out. I, mean, I know the reasons were that it was the constant cycle of recording. This is the what, what I read. Okay, it's what I read. So if it's not true, blame it on what I read. But the, the constant cycle of recording and live shows. And yeah, you guys keep up an insane schedule. Dream Theater keeps up an insane schedule. You guys are cutting albums kind of like the old days. I mean, Rush would do a turnaround and every, what, six months, a year. Uh, they, 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 they toured, they'd be writing while on tour, get in the studio, record a new album, then go back out on tour. Well, Dream Theater, you guys do that with a little bit of more space and breather, you know, meaning just the, the cycle. And I can understand where they'd be taxing. I can understand in your personal demons over which, yeah, Portnoy has had, and he's written about. How many parts is it? I call it, what do I call it? I actually made a virtual album with all of the songs dealing with Mike Portnoy's addiction. He writes about it, it you know, this is nothing, uh, okay, I don't have it in my playlist. All right. But the point is... Um, over several albums, which I think is so cool, by the way. Rush did this even in a, a, a kind of joking way. Part one, two, three, and four, Fear, for example. Your, your lyrics actually talked about all the different stages and, and, and the journey through which you went to overcome your addiction. 
And that's beautiful, man. A lot of people are suffering, and I wish we could reference this more often. And the fact that you overcame that and, and got better and got healthy again, my, I have the utmost respect for anyone dealing and trying to get over their addictions. The people who are fighting that are some of the strongest people around. You know why? Because there's millions of people addicted to stuff every day. And, you know, I'm not just talking about alcohol and drugs. How about people who can't take their eyes off of this? The phone. Um, people, you know, I mean, I could go on. Caffeine, sugar, fat, salt, sex. I mean, people have a, a, a litany of addictions and they just live with them and think that it's normal. No, it's not. No. Everything in moderation, man. I mean, come on. And, and we all should strive toward that. So, Mike, the fact that you actually uh, overcame that, wrote about it, bearing your soul in lyrics, Mike, is uh, it, what Portnoy did uh, is, is a beautiful thing. And were some great songs. Yeah, I think I, I, had a, I made a virtual folder once, like a virtual album, and I put all the songs from the different a uh, albums into it. I think I called it Mike Portnoy's 12 Steps. Uh, it's not on my playlist here. It's on a computer. But anyway, thank you, Mike, for doing that. Thank you, Portnoy, for writing about that. It takes true strength, force of will, wanting to make yourself better. So many people are caught in these loops and cycles, and they try to get better, and they slip back off the whatever, I mean, horse, cart, cabin, um, the point is, they're, they're caught in these struggles and they never escape. Those of you who actually go through the 12 steps, those of you who actually get better and live a healthier, better life, you should be commended, thanked, because it makes society better. Yeah, it makes society better. Look at the streets of our major cities right now, especially on the coast, filled with what? Drug zoned out zombies living on the streets. But the point is, addiction kills. It kills the soul, then it kills the body. And what you should really fear is anything that could actually take out your soul. Mike Portnoy is a master musician. He writes some beautiful lyrics. I tend to enjoy Mayung and Petrucci's lyrics first. I like Petrucci and his faith and belief. He speaks about these things openly. It's there, and I appreciate that. Uh, so I love, and I love John. He, he's clearly into sci-fi and fantasy. But Portnoy, you've written some amazing lyrics too. Change of Seasons. I believe you wrote swaths of that, if not most of it. A Change of Seasons is probably the most underrated Dream Theater album. It was written around the time of Images and Words. The final moments of, drain, uh, of cha a Change of Seasons the son sitting with his father and, and, and those lyrics, I, I, I cry every time. Every time. Because, of course, what person who's actually in touch with themselves and their feelings and actually has a soul cannot relate to a father and son like me and my dad, uh, John, or Mike, Mike Portnoy, you and your dad. Um, you know, any, any, any young man or, or man and his father and, and losing your father uh, would be heartbreaking anyway. But your words perfectly portray that. But they also, along with lyrics, uh, they talk about hope for the soul and the spirit carrying on, which is straight out of Metropolis Part 2, um, probably P Metropolis 1. But the point is, though, your lyrics, Mike, on... Mr. Portnoy, your lyrics on A Change of Season, beautiful. They touch my heart every time. I cry every time. Yeah, yeah, I do. Not afraid to admit it. These things of which I'm speaking, the stories that I've told about how the music has touched me, I haven't talked enough about the music. I wish I could play the music. Sometimes I hate licensing. And being allowed to play music, I'd play you music right now. I play sections of songs and I 
can't, so I can just tell you how they've affected me. And they've affected me deeply. Portnoy's music and lyrics have affected me deeply. And therefore, with that, I say welcome back. Back to the family. Welcome back, Mike. Let's all welcome Mr. Portnoy back. Because if you share any of this with me, you know of what you speak, you feel what I feel, and you know what I know about how important Dream Theater has been for almost 30 years for me, 1992. Next year, no, no, 31. Man, I'm good with math. So if I were to sum this up, Yes, welcome back, Mike. Mike Mangini. Thank you. Sorry, dude. Uh, but thank you for all these years of being an integral part of one of the best bands of all time. In my book, the band second only to Rush. And I want to thank you for that. It means a lot that you filled those proverbial shoes. Uh, your drumming is masterful, beautiful. I love the way you have your drum sets. It's different, uh, you know, with your toms and, you know, the sizes expanding to the sides instead of the traditional left to right. That's different. It was cool to see you play that. You had your overhead cymbals at one point, you know, early on. Up until recently, I believe. Uh, I think the last time I saw you, you had changed your set. Uh, but it was beautiful to see your drum set, to see you play it, to uh, see you just jamming along with Jordan to your right, to hear you keep up with John shredding, to have you keep rhythm with my young on bass. Okay, you guys are the rhythm section. All of these things, I, we can't thank you enough, Mike. So thank you, buddy. And I'm sorry. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Man. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it takes some masterful, graceful PR writing to make that sound like a... I know you took it well. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying... I'm just saying I know it stung. How could it not? Unless I don't know something which is... Probably, it's probable. Maybe it was your time in your life in which you needed to do something else. Wanted to go do something else. Explore different things. And if so, I hope so. You know, I hope that this means a new beginning for you. Whether you welcomed it or knew it was coming or not. I hope that you find another project. I look forward to seeing what that is. And I will check it out, and I'll buy your stuff and support you. And that's one thing. Everyone, if you love a band, like I do, Rush, Yes, Dream Theater, um, these, uh, that's my top three, by the way. Rush, Yes. No, Rush, Dream Theater, Yes. Um, and then Living Color. What's number five? Doesn't matter. If you love a band, then support them, especially now. When you create something and you do it for a living, you own it. And therefore, property matters. Property rights matter. Being able to make a living from the things that you create with your hands and mind matter. And therefore, you should be paid for it. And because of that, you should support the people you love. I love Rush and Dream Theater. I buy your stuff. I still buy your stuff. Um, you know, I had to, I had, didn't have to, but I have a bunch of Dream Theater's albums on vinyl. I own the CDs. I own your Blu-rays and DVDs. Uh, with Rush, same thing. I own most of Neil Peart's books. I have Rush on Blu-ray and DVD. I own the CDs, probably a couple of cassettes somewhere, and I have most of the Rush albums on vinyl as well. 
when that started up a few years ago, I had to have them. Supporting my boys. I gotta support my boys. Meaning Russian Dream Theater. I gotta support you guys. I'm not a rich man, but if I have the shekels once in a while, I'll toss them your way. Because, again, that's your property. And that's your living. And the benefits that I've gotten from your music are so profound that supporting you makes me feel good. Supporting you matters. But also supporting you ensures that you'll continue doing what you're doing. There's a reason why Dream Theater has been around this long. There's a reason why before Neil passed, they were around for 40 plus years. Because they had a core audience of people that love, appreciate, and were affected by the music. You know, Rush could still sell out stadiums for the R40 tour. I was there. I was there. Boston. My wife and I and my dad. Got to bring them to. I, I knew it would be their last time. I sigh because it's over. It's like... But I knew Rush, that would be their last tour. And I wanted to make sure I brought my dad, who in recent years, my dad has become the huge Rush fan. He, wa he watches Rush clips, reaction videos, classic videos, concert videos. He loves La Via Strangiato. He watches YouTube Rush all the time, more than me. My dad now watches and listens to Rush more than I do. Um, however, growing up, he, he could care less. It's only in the past few years he's like, oh, these guys are amazing. That's the way I feel about Dream Theater, though. I discovered them, and then I got to share them, and everyone who heard Dream Theater also loved them. The reason why my best friend in the world and I, we shared a, a common love of Russian Dream Theater. It's that common bond. It's, it's sharing something that you love, something that affects you profoundly, at the, at the soul level. Music affects us in our souls. And in so many times throughout the years, that's what Dream Theater has done. Whether with Mike Portnoy, Mike Mangini, and now Mike Portnoy again. And with this, I want to say welcome back. I want to say let's look to the future. I look forward to seeing what you guys are going to do again now that the family is back together. Now that the family's back together, I, I look with hope and optimism and excitement at what the future holds for Dream Theater. So welcome back, Portnoy. Um, yeah, you've affected me, brother, through the years. Your lyrics, again, have touched me many times. One of the best ways to convey that's through music. And Dream Theater, you guys do this masterfully. Dream Theater does this masterfully. Um, and, and Mike has been an integral part of that journey, Dream Theater's musical journey. So yeah, I look forward to the future, guys. Mike, welcome back. I look forward to seeing what you guys do. Before I say sayonara, this is today's toy of the day. This is a biker scout. Of course, from Return of the Jedi, I believe is when we first see them. This biker scout is an original 1983, so now what, 40 years old? Um, when Return of the Jedi came out, I've, this has been always one of my favorite Star Wars figures. And what's great is, I have two. Yeah, this one's been decapitated. I guess that speeder bike was going too fast through the forest at Vendor. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I have two. One with a head, one without. Um, but yeah, Toy of the Day, speeder. And I actually have two speeder bikes, originals, from uh, 1983. I They're in a box somewhere. Uh, but they, they had this cool button in back that you could press, and they would kind of explode open. Kind of like the speeder bikes did when they ran into trees and stuff on Endor. But yeah, this is uh, the Biker Scout and uh, from Star Wars. One of my many original vintage Star Wars figures. So yeah, today's toy of the day, Mr. Biker Scout. Anyway, I love this guy. And with that, guys, thank you. Welcome back, Mike Portnoy. Thank you, Mike Mangini. Dream Theater, family's back together. Let's do some good. Make some killer music, guys. Anyway, it's been great. I've really enjoyed this time reflecting, talking about Dream Theater, talking about Rush. And uh, I thank you guys so much for being with me. It means a lot. It means a lot. 
So, and with that, you guys have a blessed day. I appreciate you guys. Anyway, take care. Rock on.